All right, verse 9. For what thanks can be rendered to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? What thanks can be rendered to God? How can we thank God for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes? He said we can't thank God enough. We're so happy that you turn out the way you did. And, of course, that's true of any new convert that what we call pans out. That's kind of a crude way of putting it. But nothing to give you any greater joy than lead somebody to Christ and then to see them start getting in the Bible and start going to church and start growing. And uh, fewer and fewer of them every year. I'm amazed sometimes look out my congregation and realize the people that continue to come year in, year out. I'm amazed. Because I talk to so many people that, that they just don't, they don't do it. And you, if you done first the work in the home, you've had a hundred people tell you they're going to come and they never showed up. And if you done first in the work, you've led at least a hundred people to Christ that never showed up in the church after you led them to Christ. You need them Christ in the home. That's the end of them. And just like you get the person saved and then the devil just comes in that television, that radio and newspaper and just drowns them out and smothers them, that's the end of them. They may show up with the judgment to save, but they, but they don't pan out. They don't become anything. Ten, night and day, pray exceedingly. Pray at night time, pray in the daytime. Pray exceedingly. He said the fervent prayer of a righteous man. Pray exceedingly, not just saying prayers. There's a difference between praying and saying prayers. Before I was saved, we used to say prayers. We saw our Father short in heaven, hallowed be the name, kingdom come, we done heaven, get to heaven, get to heaven, get to heaven, get to and flip those beads around. And the guy who could say the Hail Mary and the Our Father the quickest could throw the most beads around. He'd get more time out of purgatory. He'd get indulgence, you see, for flipping the beads. So you finally got that thing down. You said, I'm not going to help me. I'm 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 going to help me. No, a, a while back, they have it in Los Angeles, they ever have it out west? What? Yeah, that's the one that thing there was. They had some fellow the National Council open in prayer, and the newspaper said it was one of the greatest prayers ever addressed to an audience. <laughs> and that's, a, that's the way good many prayers are. Night and day pray exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. And notice how the word perfect is used, perfection, the sense of completing, not the sense of sinless. And everywhere you use that way, be perfect as I am perfect. And might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. And he said the same thing of his Roman converts. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, praying to get to see him again. And he does get to see him again in the latter part of the book of Acts. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. All right, the prayer for the Christian is first, the prayer that the Lord will make him increase and abound in love one toward another in his own group. That is, that's the local church at Thessalonica, his own saved people, and toward all men. And, of course, the word men's in italics in the context is Christian. So when he says all men, he means all the men that are saved. And abound toward all men, even as we. That settles the matter, see. All saved, even as we. See, if you didn't know that it had the right word, you'd know it by what follows. Even as we and their saved men do toward you. To the end. All right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and if they abound in love, then this will result. To the end that he may establish your hearts. Now the heart is established with two things, love and grace. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Love and grace. And the heart cannot be established without these two things. The Bible praise the Lord, establish and strengthen you. Uh, Hebrews chapter... Uh, I was going to say 13, yeah, 13, 9, 13, 9. And one place says, if you increase in love, the end, to the end, your heart will be established unblameable in holiness before God. The other verse says in Hebrews 13, 9, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. Read after me, everybody. Be not carried about with divers 
certain strange doctrines. Let's try it one more time. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. See, that's very important. For it is a good thing that the heart be established. Be established. How do you get your heart established? Your heart established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. The man is always occupied with the meat of the word. It doesn't profit him. And the heart does not get established. He's unstable. Now, notice how the word meat was used there. Come back to Hebrews chapter uh, Hebrews chapter 5. And Hebrews 5, 12, notice when he said meats, he was talking about strong, advanced doctrine for the believer. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Clear warnings. And boy, if ever a book was advanced doctrine, Hebrews is it. Hebrews 5, 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers... You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk, not of strong meat. Verse 14, But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, if the strong meat is no good till the heart's established, and the heart can't be established without love and grace. All right, First Thessalonians chapter three, verse thirteen. Yes, sir. Well, he says, uh, in, turn to Romans. This love that I have for each other comes from a a divine source, and he gives you this source in Romans chapter. Oh, I don't have it marked. I want the verse that says, And, went, and hope maketh not a shame, for the love of God is shed abroad in the hearts. What? Five. Yeah. Five, five. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Those things have to come from the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then further than that, when you get down to them, you don't want to stay occupied with them. See? He says, I'm not proud of them that have been occupied. Now, when you're occupied, your time is taken up. Now, you take this class right here. I'll give you some stuff, frankly, that, that is strong doctrine, and it's strange and diverse. I mean, I, you know that. I've given some of you folks some stuff that uh, faculty members at Dallas and Moody and Fort Worth aren't going to find for another 15 years. But what I do when I give you those things is give you those things and then go right on, see, like we're going on right on now, and talking about soul winning and talking about praying. And the reason why I do that is because it won't profit you to get occupied with those things. See? And folks, they have, they have kind of wrong idea about that. Uh, those that don't wish me exactly the best wishes, and there are those, like the Campbellite says, there are those, you know, that don't exactly wish me uh, welfare, think my whole ministry is just teaching odd and strange and queer stuff to get folks way out in left field. And those people, either people that are ignorant and stupid and don't know what they're talking about, or they're people who have been exposed and got upset and disturbed and got tore up in the middle of because you folks have been with me for years, you know, just didn't solve. And I will hit something once in a while. But we're not going to get occupied. You know, if I like some of the brethren, you know what I'd do? Set chart right out there in the great deeps. I'd start teaching that every Sunday school, Sunday morning, and run it about a year, 52 Sundays. And you get so tired of that thing, you could just scream. You could just scream. And you get to be the deadest congregation. You just get dead and cold and stiff, and you just get the place where you just looked up, and then looked down, and then looked up, and then looked down. Your mind is kind of blank in between. Then when you went home, you got one or two words and meditated on them and thought about them and looked them up and then argued with the brethren about the one or two words. And that's a, that's a devil's church. You don't want that kind of a church. You've got to have the milk. 
and the grace and the love. And without that, the strong meat's no good. Uh, go on a diet of strong meat for two months and see how it comes out. Just eat nothing but barbecue pork and roast pork and sirloin steak and lobster and clam and oysters for two weeks and see where you wind up. All right, 313. To end, he may ask, well, some of the brethren do it doctrinally, man. I mean, they really do. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Oh, I notice two things here. Uh, 313, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And then in chapter 4, look at verse 14 and 15 and 16, the Lord Jesus Christ coming for his saints. For his saints. He comes for them in chapter 4, verse 13, 14, 15, 16. And the reference here is coming with them, with them, in chapter 3. All right, uh, 313, to the end you may establish your hearts unblameable in the holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Four, furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and it's now here on... Uh, Holiness, like 313, and clean living. 4 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, talking about the Christian walk, and to please God, the Bible says we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And he said, If I didn't, uh, if I please men, I'd not be the servant of God. How you ought to walk and to please God. Please God first, please others next, please yourself last. The Bible says over there in Romans that uh, we're not to seek our own, uh, please our own self with the benefit of others that might be saved. And uh, Paul says, even as Christ pleased not himself, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. 4.1, that you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. Not a man-pleaser, but a God-pleaser first, first. Now, I'm not saying being mean to people, rude to people, nasty to people, but a God-pleaser first and a man-pleaser second. I realize what I say that. It's kind of hard to have you get that from me. I wish Bob Gray would tell you that, and you'd believe it. Or Brother Harold Henniger, one of those fellows. If one of these nice, and they're good men, they really are, and one of these nice, smooth, well-polished, cultured gentlemen got up and that uh, really was, you know, and polite, nice people all the time, courteous, never missed a trick. If he got up and told it to you, you'd believe it, see? But it's kind of hard for me to tell you. You don't, you kind of, you kind of look at me with unbelief. <laughs> and you kind of think when I say, please God, not men, that I mean, please God, then beat everybody else up. And I don't mean that. I don't mean that. <laughs> all right, four one. So you would abound more and more, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Then he claims the authority of Christ, see? We gave you the commandments by the Lord Jesus, and he, he claims Christ's authority in what he's doing. For well, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, setting apart. Christ should be set apart, cleansing himself from filthiness of flesh and spirit, he says in another passage. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Lord, people should be a separated people. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Dirty pictures, dirty habits, dirty thoughts, and all that business have to go. For this is the will of God. Now, if you want the directive will of God, that's it. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. One, that you should abstain from fornication. Two, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification in honor. Three, verse six, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. All right, back to verse 4. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, I read the, I read the passage to believe that this is my vessel. Paul said a, a vessel fit for the master's use, if it's gold or silver. Uh, a, a vessel God's going to use has to separate itself from vessels of earth and clay over in Timothy. All right, I take for granted this is the vessel. Paul says, we have this treasure in a what? All right, so I take it that way. I take this as the vessel, and the Lord's in me. 
My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And I should be able to possess this vessel, that is, control it, possess it, in sanctification, honor, and not in the lust of concupiscence. That's a fine old English word, meaning uh, uh, just unleash depravity. Now, there are not many commentators that take it that way, and if you bought any other commentator, you wouldn't find it reading that way. All the commentators in living letters read it this way. They say the vessel is your wife, and they say that every one of you, Christian men, should know how to take possession of a woman for a wife in sanctification, honor, and not marry because of a lustful motive or purpose in marriage. Well, that's the reading. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. You might be able to read it that way. That's always seemed to be a little bit stretched, kind of. But you'll find that way in living letters exactly. And you'll find that in, in Lang, Dumalo, James Fawcett, and Brown, and then the Scholars' Union. And they'll say that the reference here is talking about when a Christian uh, takes a wife, that the motive for doing it should be uh, honor, see, and sanctification, not just animal lust. Verse 5, as the Gentiles which know not God, implying the determining factor in a heathen marriage is just bodily attraction as the Gentiles. But in a Christian marriage, you shouldn't be. It ought to be more than that. All right, verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Then further, the last petition, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Uh, defraud is to take something on lawfully or not give proper payment for it. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Uh, I preached on that one time in Brent, and up to that time we had uh, several people come into Bible class and really seem to enjoy things and get along pretty good. And some of their employees came to church here, and I made the mistake of saying that if an employer didn't employ an employee, what was due him financially, he was defrauding him, and the Lord would avenge him. And that finished that right there, you know. <laughs> I mean, you find a bunch of dogs fighting out the street, and you throw a stone there, one of them hollers, you've got the right dog, brother. you got him. He hit dog yells. And Christians are famous for defrauding. Uh, Jacob defrauds Esau. And other examples of fraud. A good example of fraud is the New Schofield Reference Bible. Amen. The New Schofield Reference Bible at the first piece in the first page says the authorized King James Version. I got news for you. That's not the authorized version. That has 500 changes in the text. Now, you know what that is? That's fraud. And when you defraud a man, you say, and I'm going to sell you this suit, and this suit is 100% wool, and the guy buys it 80% nylon, 20% dacron, or some fool thing like that. Well, you defrauded him, see? And I'll give you another good example. This New American Standard Version... <laughs> The guy came out there in the paper and said, this is translated from the original Greek text. He doesn't have the original Greek text. You know what it is? He's a defrauder. You know he's trying to get you to do? He's trying to get you to buy that book, thinking that you've got a book that's better than any other book because it came in the original Greek text. That's fraud. You know something? That's just what they do down the midway when the fair comes to town. That fellow sets up that booth and says, put this ring over the pussycat or whatever it is, you know, and show all these little things up here, you know, and then he moves, under the, moves the target under the table and the board and gives you an air rifle with a hole in it where it doesn't shoot straight. That's fraud, see? And you know one of the advantages of not being saved, you're 27, is you don't believe all the stuff you used to. The older you get, the more skeptical you get as an unsaved man. And the Lord hadn't saved me when he saved me. I've been a skeptical of everything. And I learned one thing. Boy, this world's a fast place. Boy, it's got some wheelers and dealers, man. It's got some dealers, boy. And a lot of them are Christians. A lot of them are Christians. Some guy had a 
from the John Birch Society, or he maybe was on a tape, but sometime the John Birch Society was called to this house to talk to somebody, and he went down this house all full of hippies, about half of them on a trip when he came in. And they came in there and said, well, we didn't call you, that was a joke. And he said, well, joke or not, he said, I got my slides and stuff here, and I'm going to show them to you. And they said, you show that stuff to us? He said, yeah, and he went in and set up. And he was with them nearly two hours, and they just ate it up. And when it got all through, they said, that's good, man, that's good. And this fellow said, well, he said, if it's good, why don't you fellas wake up? Don't you know somebody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes? And those hippies said, we know that, man. He said, we know we'll be taken for a ride. We're just trying to figure out who's doing it. <laughs> a lot of truth in that. Yeah. Uh, spirit, uh, a, a Christian, yeah, a, a spiritual brother, yeah, probably, probably, something? Yes, it does. Uh, well, the Old Schofield Bible has a paragraph in the mark in the middle of a sentence in Joel 2. But, uh, but still, that, uh, that isn't quite as bad as other business, yeah. Yes, he did.
But I'll tell you, when any man stands and tells you the Bible that... Well, I was going to preach this uh, next Sunday, not here. But I also I wind it up. But when any man gets up and tells you the Bible that saved him and called him to preach and gave him the support for 50 years and gave him his souls, you can't believe him. That man is beginning to slip up here. That's the truth. That's the truth. All right, he's saying, last, i got one I can believe in. I've got one I can believe in all along. And I'll tell you something. No, I won't. Go ahead. No, we got to get on back to the Uh, no, he, he might, they might. They might. They, that's right, they're very careful while he was alive, that's true. Yeah, toward the end. Toward the end. Well, let's get off that. Let's get on the text now. Uh, 4 6. That no man go beyond the fraud his brother in any matter. Any matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us on uncleanness. That's not the, the end of the calling. The end of the calling is holiness. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness. Any uncleanness in our lives is out of place with our calling, see? Our calling is holiness. And when we're holy and separated and clean, then we're in our calling. We're fulfilling our calling. A, he, for, he therefore that despiseth, that despises the calling, seven. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, God called us. Despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given to us his Holy Spirit, which explains the calling. But as touching brother of love, you need not, not that I write unto you. He's been talking here about carnal love, see, and marriage relationship. Now as touching brother of love, that is, Christian with Christian. Any kind of relationship. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you for yourselves are taught of God. John 13, 14, 15. That is, Christ was very clear about that before he went back to the cross. By this shall men know your disciples, and you love one another. Um, as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write to you for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia, localized love. Christ said, if you love those that love you, what thank have you? Do not even publicans do the same? And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. Paul says in Romans, let love be with partiality. Let love be without dissimulation. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more and love everybody. But say, or love Dr. John R. Rice. That's right. That's right, and I mean it. Say, I mean it. And when I make these statements here, I always make these statements in a certain context. One of them got back to Bill Rice. I don't know what happened, but I said something somewhere. These tapes picked up, and I'm always saying something, and somebody's always taping something. So I don't have a chance, man. I'm bound to get messed up sooner or later. You can't talk much as I do without contradicting yourself. No one in the world you can do it. And so it got back to Bill Rice, and Brother Ruffman said you were uh, uh, something a simpleton and an ignoramus or a fool or something, you know. And what I said, I made some statement about an ASB and him recommending the newspaper and said anybody that would do that in, see? So he took it to heart and said, that's me. <laughs> and uh, I've had dinner with Brother Bill Rice and enjoyed fellowship with him, and I'll probably cross his path again. I'm bound to. I'll cross them all again before I get through. I'll be going to Beach and Vicks Church in about oh, a couple of months, and I'll, I'll run right smack into him. And uh, he ain't going to bug me any. I'm going to enjoy the meal, man. I'm going to enjoy the meal. They get pressed me. I'm going to talk about the mullet, you know, and the croakers. And the... <laughs> I'm not going to be drawing that professionalism, brother. I'm not going to do it. Where I've got one work competing with theirs, and it's a neck and neck run by the rail to see who can do the most. Huh? That, that's out, man. That's out. And what I see, Bill, I have some explaining to do. Because he's six feet four. <laughs> Love them all. Yep. I, I miss it when you came through. When we was up there in verse 2, we were talking about commandments. Did they gave what commandments was Paul gave? Well, verbal. They weren't written because this is first epistle. So he said, when I was with you, I told you those things. All right, we're going to have to close here. Uh, verse uh, 
Well, that's a good place to close, 10. Because in 11, these students talk about working. <laughs> that didn't come out right. Uh, 10. Boss, has you got a man on your roll named Simpson? Yeah, well, I just thought you maybe wrote me down as Samson. Well. Oh, I see all the work they're giving him to do. That's that one. All right, ten, indeed you do it, toil all the brethren which are in Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, to increase more and more, that is, increase in love, not toward just your own group, but toward all the other Christians, too. That's the benefit of having guys in like Shelley, you see, and those fellows, and those missionaries. And the idea is that our ministry will never be just put down here, we'll we just have to ramble and scramble among ourselves to get the thing spread out, spread out. All right, now we're going to take a break, and I have one on the table. All right, First Thessalonians 4, 9. But it's touching brotherly love. And the Bible has a lot to say about it. And, of course, in the Bible says brotherly love is talking about uh, saved people. Saved people are brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're called brethren. But it's touching brotherly love, not a reference to a physical brother, but a spiritual brother. But it's touching brotherly love. Your Christian brothers and sisters ought to be closer to you than your physical brothers and sisters if your physical brothers and sisters are not saved. Now, folks say, yeah, but some of these Christians are hard to get along with, I know, but did you ever see some fights in families? I mean, I've got three boys in my family, and they're brothers, and any one of them can get along better with a neighbor's kid than they can their own brother. And uh, I don't know whether you mothers have the same problem us mothers have <laughs> with boys, but I'll tell you one thing right now, uh, if, uh, if neighbors got along as badly as most brothers get along, it'd be Cain and Abel all the way. And you ever notice that your boys, you get them play almost nice than anybody else's boys except themselves? I mean, uh, I mean, after all, he's your brother. Well, you know, more reason to hit him in the head. <laughs> and if you're saved, those saved brothers and sisters, you may have trouble with them. They'd be like a big family argument sometime, but they still will be closer to you than your own physical flesh. Come to Matthew 13.55, I'm going to show you what I mean. Matthew 13.55. Matthew 13.55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren? James, Joseph, Simon, Judah, and his sisters. See, he's talking about the man's brothers and sisters. Christ, brothers and sisters according to the flesh. The children that Mary had after Christ. Brothers, James, called James the brother of the Lord in Galatians. Joseph, Simon, Judas, he had four brothers and some sisters. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended to him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Now Christ says here, being a prophet, he was without honor in his own country, and he was without honor in his own house. In other words, his brothers and sisters didn't think too much of him. Turn to John, the Gospel of John, and see it again. Gospel of John. And get to uh, John chapter 10. No, it isn't John 10. I'm looking for John. It's earlier than that. Or later than that. What is it? Seven. Yeah, seven. Uh, John 7, 2. John 7, 2. Now, this passage shows you the situation in Christ's human household. John chapter 7, verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said to him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man to do with anything in the secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Now, five, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Neither did his brethren believe in him. Matter of fact, only one of them got converted, and that was James. And that's why he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that when he rose from the dead, he was seen of 500 brethren, and one of them was James. 
First Peter, then James. And that James in First Corinthians 15 is not James Ebedee. It's his brother. So we have one of those brothers believing in him out of four. One out of four, and no reference in the sisters. All right, Mark chapter 3, verse 32. Yes. Is there any easy way to distinguish the Jewish brothers? I'm not to reference all my physical Well, James has to be a physical brother, because he's the only man in the Bible that's ever called James the Lord's brother. Paul's never called the Lord's brother. Peter's never called the Lord's brother. James is called the Lord's brother. Neither did his brethren. Well, the reason why it has to be is the verse I give you back in Matthew said a prophet is not without honor in his own country and in his own house. So you, now that limits it to the immediate family. You can't, you can't make that cousin. That's the house. All right, Mark chapter 3, verse 31. Now these are verses to show that, that although physical relationships should be closest, they're not. And if you've been saved very long... I'm sure some of you have been through this thing, maybe not all of you, but some of you have been through this thing where somebody who was your flesh and blood suddenly became just as strange to you as a foreigner, and somebody you never saw for in your life came as close to you as a sister or a brother, or a mother or a father. Now, if you've been saved very long, you're going to, you're going to run into that. You can't, you can't help it. And uh, I know especially some of the young people get in the word, and they go back up north, you know, uh, for Christmas or Thanksgiving. And some of those trips up there, you just assume lie on broken glass three days and three nights go up there. And I know exactly how it is. But people don't understand that. Uh, people said to me back in the old days, they said, why don't you ever go up and see your mother and father? Go up and visit your mother and father. Well, now, you just can't say, well, I just don't enjoy being with my mother and father, so I pass them off, you know. But uh, let's just face it, they're dead and gone now. I did not enjoy being with them. We have nothing in common. I've got, I've got men here in town that are 65 to 70 years old that I'm closer to than my own father. And coming up the ministry, I knew men 60 and 70 are much closer than me, my own father. And I've got mothers all over this country. i got farm women that are in their 80s and 90s now all over Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi that if I came to their house and they opened the door and I went in there and sat down, I'd feel much more home than in my own house. And there's no way to explain it. Except I, I, I got removed from my family. And people don't understand Thanksgiving and Christmas time. You're going back up, you know, to spend some time with your parents. What? What, man? What? I mean, you go, come up, open the door, step in the room, have a cigarette all through the building. Well, I can take that if that was all it was. And there's cocktails and whiskey bottle up there in the pantry. Well, I don't particularly care for that. And then you sit down there, here's the television going over in the corner, in one room, and stare at another, both at the same time, can't hear, so I don't take care for that. They then come the neighbors and sit in, they come around and talk, and they sit there and they talk all day about the Super Bowl and about the World Series and about uh, Zaza Boom and her latest moving picture with uh, Curly Bear, whoever the guy was. And they sit around there and they talk about movies, and they talk about ball games, and I sit there just, you know... And uh, 23 years ago, fine, I could have joined in with him and said, yeah, what about him? What about this movie he was in? Did you see him in this one, you know, and got in it? But you can't get it in anymore. And so you go in there, you sit there like a wooden Indian, you look around that room like a tree full of owls, you know, and try to act like you're, you know, and you can't fake it. I mean, I don't care how polite and nice you ask, they sense you're not with them. So they sense your heart is not in it. And so you just sit there like a cold cat in the snow, you know, for two or three or four hours and just find an excuse yourself and leave the room and feel like a perfect fool. And then you go out and say, what's the matter with him? You know, they can't understand it. And I went through all that. And even going through that, I saw my parents three times after I got saved. But uh, I, I got nothing. I can't say it's sitting and stand here and I got anything out of it. Nothing. I'm sure they didn't. I mean, just a, just a, just a grind. And the same way with some of your brothers and sisters, and some of your, maybe some of your own sons and daughters, though you're older. There comes a time there when you get in the spiritual fellowship with the Lord, you get close to the Lord, when the Lord draws a line between you and unsaved people. 
And the further you go in the word, the line comes down to some of the Christians. You just get further and further out. You're just like an oddball that's sitting way out there in a limb somewhere. Everybody just, you know, what's that? Sitting out there. And uh, it, isn't that, uh, it isn't that you desire it. I didn't desire it. I mean, I'd, if I had my way, I wouldn't be like I am. I'd like to give me a nice place out in the country, about 15 acres, and uh, my girl knows how to make homemade bread and sit out there and just do nothing but just sit around and read my Bible and grow crops, you know, and raise uh, uh, corn and watermelon and potatoes and just let the war go to hell. I, I couldn't care anything less about it. I've done anything with me. I don't care nothing about it. <laughs> but the Lord's not going to let me be that way. Or going to shove me and shove me and shove me and shove me and shove me until everybody says, they're the greatest freak of the century, half man, half beast, born in Africa with a veil over his face. I've seen it. <laughs> the wonder of the 20th century, you know, what kind of business. And when you get saved, you know that your brothers and sisters are a different crowd. They're not your old crowd. Look at Mark 3.31. There came then his brethren, his mother, and standing without, sent to him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said to him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he said, Who is my mother? What kind of man is that? Wouldn't you call it breaking the commandment? And the Bible said, Are you father and your mother? What would you think of a man if you said, Your mother's outside? He said, Who is my mother? You know, the Lord says some things sometime that if, if you got stop think about him, you'd wonder why they didn't crucify him a year after he began his ministry. Instead of waiting three years, a guy says to me, said, the paper, you know, he said, would you care to have some of this? And uh, pass through the stuff and looks at his hands and he had not cleaned his fingernails. And the Lord looks up at him and says, you haven't cleaned your heart. Please pass the salt at the table with a fellow, you know. And somebody comes out there and says, your mother came all the way from Jerusalem to see you. Who is my mother? I don't know my mother. Who is my mother or my brethren? Question. No answer. So he looks around. He looks around on them and sat about him and said, and here it comes, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the will of God, that's what determines your relationship, the will of God. He said in one place, this is the will of him that sent me, that you believe on him whom he has sent. For whoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. He had hundreds of mothers, and he had thousands of sisters. And he had hundreds of brothers and thousands of brothers, but they weren't his physical brothers. Let's try one more, Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Matthew 19, 28. Matthew 19, 28. It's a new family. Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration of the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that have forsaken houses, or brethren, see it didn't work out. So somebody left them. Somebody forsook their brothers. Back in the Old Testament, the Levites got up and drew swords and killed three thousand of their brethren or a brethren, or sister, forsaking a sister, or a father, forsaking a father, or mother, forsaking your mother. That's what it says. Forsaking your mother. Or a wife, forsaking your wife. That's what it says. Or children. That's what it says. You see, there's a long gap, beloved of God, between the kind of Christianity that you hear preach and taught in America today and what you find in that book. When you're talking about discipleship and these things talking about here and earning a millennial inheritance and earning a millennial reward, he's talking about me first and everybody else next. Now, what would you think of a man if he came in here tonight and stood up here and said, Now, all you folks that quit your families for me are God's going to reward. See? Folks don't read the Lord right. I mean, a lot of Christians don't know the Lord. 